All right. Hey, uh, my name is Dr. Sharnell Wolverton Sihan. Very, very excited about this episode. We're, we're, we have a new guest, and sometimes we have new guests, sometimes we have old guests. This is a brand new guest. I just happened to find his brilliant art on social media and just some of the things that he has said, posted. It really caught my attention, and I think it's really relevant to where we are. Um, it, it, maybe it's just me personally, but I'm seeing as across the board that there has been some mind shifts. And so, um, his name is David Hayward and yet we, um, actually the naked pastor, which I think is something that, um, is really funny to kind of <laughs> name call yourself or to pronounce as, but, um, before we get started, I just want to say, Hey to Craig, how you doing, Craig? Hi. Yeah. When you said uh, we're going to be interviewing a naked pastor, I was like, seriously, is this just a new denomination? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but no, it's, it's great to meet you, David. And uh, like I say, I'm really excited to get into the conversation because it's uh, right up my alley again. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Glad yeah. to be here. <clears throat> yes. And um, before we get going, definitely go to swiftfire.org or drcharnel.com. You can get on our newsletter to find out what else is coming up and what we're doing. Um, but I think that might be, I'm looking at my list here of things uh, to make sure I do. We do have a, um, a class that we are teaching on abundance and abundance doesn't just mean money. It has to do with health, you know, social um, resources, things like that. Your mind, your mindset, your heart set, that'll be starting at the end of this May. Um, you can go to Swift Fire for that information, but Leslie and I are going to be doing that. But without further ado, I'm going to just have Naked Pastor come in and um, welcome you. And just thank you so much for being with us. I would love to know, how did you get this title, Naked Pastor? And give us a little background about who you are, where, where you live. You know, how did you even get in this spot in this season of time? Okay. Well, thanks for having me on the show. It's good to be here. And hi, everybody. Um so I'm, I'm, I'm a new guest, but I'm also old. I've been around for a while. <laughs> and uh, I, I grew up in a home which was religious and also there was art. So my father was an artist on the side. And um, ever since I can remember, I drew and I painted and things like that. But I was also very interested in spiritual things. Um, it was a Christian home I grew up in, quite conservative. And I ended up investing, you know, a lot of my life into, you know, conservative religion, Christian religion. I ended up that, you know, I call myself my own ecumenical movement because I've been in so many denominations, but I was, I was baptized Anglican. And then I, you know, we went uh, Baptist and then Pentecostal and Presbyterian and United and you name it. I've been there independent. Um, but uh, anyway, long story short, I ended up going to Bible college. Then I went to seminary got my master's in theology. Then I ended up getting ordained, um, serving the church as a pastor for 30 years, all the while doing art on the side. And then in 2010, I decided I, I couldn't really keep growing um, as an individual. I was experiencing restrictions on my personal freedom and um, my sense of exploration and adventure when it comes to my own intellect and spiritual development and everything. And I decided in 2010 to leave the ministry and decided to put all my efforts into a blog I'd been running for five years called The Naked Pastor. Uh, so I started the blog Naked Pastor in 2005. I, I, I chose the name um, because at that time, like The Naked Chef, uh, oh. The Naked Archaeologists, The Naked Truth, all those were kind of popular at the time. And basically, uh, me being a pastor, I wanted people to really see inside the life of a pastor and the life of a church. So that's why I called myself The Naked Pastor. I was going to be real and raw and transparent and open and honest and just tell everybody what really goes on in the ministry and in the church. And, um, you know, I was writing blog posts and stuff. And then I decided one day in 2006 to see if I could express my art through a cartoon. I really like a good cartoon. Uh, and I, I tried it and they took off. I mean, people just really enjoyed them. And 
and I enjoyed drawing them. And, and so now there's over 4,000 of my cartoons out there, Wow! you know, causing trouble. And, uh, I, <laughs> um, it's, it's when I left the ministry in 2010, I've been blogging now for five years. And now that was, you know, in 2010, 13 years ago. And, uh, I've been doing naked pastor ever since full time, you know, I, I didn't, I, I not only cartoon, I write, I've got books, I, I've got a YouTube channel, I, you know, I speak, I, I, I have, I do paintings as well. So I'm very busy doing all kinds of things. Wow. But having fun. Having that's fun, that's the key, having fun. Having yeah. fun. Yeah, that's definitely. That's yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the thing that stands out to me, number one, yes, absolutely raw, absolutely real. And I've been accused of that. I know Craig has been accused of that. I think it's a compliment, but it's also kind of funny when people say, oh my gosh, we just like you because you're so real. And I, I always want to say like, am I supposed to be like somebody else? Like, I, I, how can I be someone else? Like, this is just who I am. You know, it, I just find it interesting comment, but, um, but you, you're a lot of your theme of what I've seen is about the deconstruction, right? Of whether it's an individual belief system or religion in general, um, right. you know, for just so you have a, a grid for Craig and I, um, uh -huh. I didn't grow up anything. Um, I had an, a real actual encounter at four years old, tried to explain that to my family and, you know, um, I guess there were probably a few Lutherans, um, maybe, maybe a great grandmother or something, but not anything, you know, no Bible being read, no prayers being made, you know, no churches uh -huh. going, you know, um, but fast forward when I moved to Louisiana from Germany, um, that is a big, you know, Bible belt kind of deal situation where it's like, if you didn't have a friend, if you weren't in a church setting. And so I was in, I brought into a church and then I did the whole Bible school, went to seminary, uh, and had 20 something years of ministry as well, but then started all along asking questions about, well, what about this? And what about that? And what did Jesus really say? And look at the strongs and look at this other translation. And, you know, and they yeah. didn't really always like that too much. Um, you know, and Craig has kind of a similar, I'll let him share, but we, you know, we love, the exploration, like you mentioned, and the freedom to be able to ask questions and or look above, you know, above over the fence a little bit and to see if there's any correlations or just to give a different perspective sometimes. And um, yes. so, you know, um, Craig has many, many times talked about the deconstruction. Mm -hmm. And I don't know um, if you want to say anything, Craig, but, you know, speak into that a little bit and or mm -hmm. both of you. Yeah, well, well, from my own experience, just just to paint the picture, um, <clears throat> like I did grow up in a very Christian home. Um, I went to a Christian school for thirteen years, from being three to sixteen. Um, you know, private Christian education, uh, church, you name it, I did it. You know, it was our whole life, um, and uh, <clears throat> it was weird for me. Like, it's like my, my my dad, for example, was was very you know loved loved God and very Christian, but he couldn't. <laughs> tolerate church life he just couldn't handle it he just couldn't be in that and I would and now I see as, as, I've, as I've become an adult I see that as a bit of a lifeline for our family because the, we knew there was something more we knew that there was more out there now it was very Pentecostal very evangelical tongue speaking you know exuberant worship type stuff that, that so we thought you know we've got everything but there was always this there's something more like yourself, there's this spirit of adventure, this spirit of hunger and desire, and just like, it's got to be more than this. You know, how can I read these things in the Bible and it not be an experience? Why do we always put it in the past or some far off galaxy, far, far away, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's like, no, this has got to be real for now. So it's been a journey for many years, but it was really about 2016 that my whole worldview collapsed um you know we talk about spiritual awakening or that sort of thing um when i began to see the errors in the interpretations of the scriptures and you know how jesus had been misrepresented by a religious culture um and <laughs> discovering the real christ um the real jesus i guess was it was, was a how i would describe it and uh 
I'd love to hear your experience, like about deconstruction and and what happened with you, really, and and you know we'll go from there. Uh huh. Yeah, that's that's uh, your story. Sounds very very familiar. You know, of course, I'm I'm talking with people all the time who are deconstructing and so on. Um, so I, I I always need to remind myself that my job that I I sort of um, assumed when I took on the ro- the role of naked pastor was for me to be open and honest about my life. And uh, it, it involved being a pastor and my theological struggles and, you know, the conflict in the church and, you know, all, all that stuff. Um, and so on the, on the one hand, I, I, I don't feel any, any angst or urgency to instruct people. I'm sharing. I'm just sharing my story. I happen to also understand that people are either inspired or repulsed by my story. Um, what I hope, though, is that people are inspired to live live free. That's been my driving force ever since I can remember, is I want to be free to be myself, to be my authentic self. And hopefully I'm inspiring other people to be free to be their authentic self. I mean, that's what that's what creativity is. And I believe everybody's creative. Everybody is creative in some way. And, and creativity just means expressing yourself. I mean, that, the best musicians that we remember, the best art that we remember, you know, are, are, are uh, creators or creations that stand out as unique and raw representations of humanity and so on. And so that's what I'm striving to do. I'm just, I'm just trying to be honest. And therefore, because I'm not, my first intention is not to instruct people. My first intention is just to be open about my life. I'm all over the place. People think I am all over the place. Like, <laughs> I'm inconsistent. I'm random. I'm spontaneous. I'm not committed. I'm disloyal. I'm. Confused. Sound like a true artist. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just all over the place. But that's that's just that's my story, and I think that's most people's story, actually. But we, 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 most people conceal that out of fear of being rejected or appearing foolish or whatever. So, you know, I started talking about deconstruction way back in 2008 um, as, a, as a way to understand the way we grow spiritually. It's when we start questioning our adopted or inherited beliefs and quit. Uh, we stop assuming everything we've been taught is true. We start questioning and maybe even challenging some of those things that we've been taught and you know we sort of see where that leads us so for me it eventually led me out of the church because I, I could no longer <clears throat> continue on my path inside the church uh you know it was, it was an amicable divorce and everything but mm-hmm. i had to go my way and and the church wanted to go its way and so um i went my way i still feel like um I still feel like I'm in the game somehow, even though I'm not an, a member anywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I still feel like I'm a part of the I'm a part of the game, and um, I'm involved with all kinds of people who are right across the spectrum from church going believers to people who've quit the church and are atheists now, and everybody in between. So it's 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 quite a journey because, like I said, my my desire is to be free to be my authentic self. And if that leads other people to be free to be their authentic self, then I feel like I've accomplished something. And whether that whether that leads whoever they are to being a more committed believer or, a, you know, a full on atheist or whatever, that to me, the outcome is not the point. The point is you chose out of your own personal freedom to be who you are. And that to me is what the, is the most important thing. Right. Yeah. And to me, that's a hundred percent what Jesus would do. If we want to talk about what would Jesus do? Jesus didn't care what someone believed or what their upbringing was or their background. There was true unconditional love. And I love that you are presenting and just being you without like fighting or needing to be right. Or, you know, that's something that I've really learned from some of my more recent mentors, Gary Young, um, 
you know, um, Dr. David Stewart. I mean, he was never threatened. They were never threatened by someone else not agreeing with them and or needing to be right or like some ego thing. You know, they were just like, oh, you believe in rabbits are from, you know, unicorns. Awesome. Great. I love you so much. And, you know, yeah. Right. You know, just that freedom and that unconditional, literally unconditional love. And we throw away that term around, you know, unconditional love. But what is unconditional love, you know, and like literally being able to just to love without taking it personal if they don't necessarily agree or like you or like me or, you know, it's just like, you know, hey, if you like it, great. If you don't, that's great, too. And peace, you know. <laughs> Well, in, in 2009, I had a very profound sort of um, a moment, which it, it was like I I suddenly saw and felt the interconnectedness of everything, the oneness of all things. No, I wasn't on mushrooms or anything like that. It was just like, it was just a, a moment. It was a gift. It, it felt, it was just uh, in the afternoon and um, I was kind of halfway between being awake and, and falling asleep and it, like a nap kind of thing. And I just had this moment where I just knew that we're all one, we're all connected. And um, I just experienced this peace of mind that's never left ever since. And it was such a profound moment that I, that's what actually, you know, if you add it up, it was within the year that I left the church because I started sharing this and of course it provoked a lot of people uh, including the denomination i was a part of and um it it just made me realize that um you know when 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 jesus in the gospels he compares uh um like grace or or justice or whatever to the to the sun or to the rain that that falls on everyone the sun shines on everyone the rain falls on everyone. Um, maybe they didn't know about gravity back then. Gravity attracts everything. Nothing's excluded. That that's that's the definition of love. It's not this sort of romantic, sentimental feeling. Love is the reason it's unconditional is because it's indiscriminate, mm -hmm. and it it's like gravity. It's like sun. It's like rain. And it doesn't pick and choose. There's no in, there's no out. It's everything is, is included. All is included. And, and there's no anxiety about that. There's no fear. And so when I, when I experienced that, it, 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 uh, and I realized that we're all one and just, it's just our thoughts that seem to separate us, but that's all they are. They're just little thoughts dancing around in our little heads that they don't, we're not really divided. It's just our thoughts that make us think we are. And so um, that's why I think, um, you know, characters like Jesus uh, and, and the, when we, we look at the gospels and we read between the lines, this radical person who loved and it was, it did appear unconditional because it just, it's, it's like sun, rain and gravity, right. you know? Yeah. And, like I say, for me, it was discovering, I don't like isms personally, um, because I think, you know, your boxes, ideas and thoughts in, I don't do isms, but it was discovering the universal Christ, you know, the Christ that fills all and that is in all, yeah. um, just broke my box open, just, just, it just, it just flung my mind open, like I couldn't look at someone without seeing the Christ in them. Uh -huh. anyone even the worst people on the planet you know or in my mind anyway um christ is the all and fills in all yeah. um, and you know that all of a sudden muslims weren't demonic to me you know atheists weren't trying to harm me and buddhists weren't you know try evil or whatever you know all these isms and ists and all this all that went away you know I, it's like this yeah. this universal consciousness just entered my entire being and mm -hmm. you, you truly see that the earth really is filled with the glory and as, as to, to coin a, a christian term um and regardless of where people are at it enabled me to see people as their true selves or what i believe is their true divine self right um and it was a it was an astounding shift a paradigm shift for me because you know 
truth be told, the, the religious thinking is is a very fearful one. It's like, oh, everyone's out to get you and you need to make everyone think like you. That all just left. <clears throat> and I just saw the beauty in everything. And it was a wonderful uh, experience to have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If, if you can relate to that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I absolutely can. And, and it's interesting, too, like, um, you know, my, my de deconstruction started when I was graduating from seminary way back when I was 25 years old. <coughs> I read a book um, that made me start questioning the inspiration of Scripture. Now, up to that point, I just assumed the inspiration of Scripture, the three eyes, inspired, inerrant, infallible. And I just believed it and assumed it. But when I was graduating from seminary, it suddenly struck me, maybe it's not. And, and it wasn't like I, I just suddenly rejected the Bible or anything. That, it's just that that seed of doubt was planted. And that began, it was like a corrupt computer code was inserted into my hard drive. And it just took decades to crash my system. And literally, and, and uh, it took like 30 something years. And because I was unwilling to reject everything that I believed or, or experienced up to that point. And, and so I was trying to figure out a way and it took me 30 years to do it. I tried to figure out a way to integrate all I'd experienced and believed with this newfound understanding Um and, and it was in 2009 when I had that moment when it all came together. It was like a, a final piece of the puzzle was clicked in and the full picture was there. And, and finally, I, I had that peace of mind that I was seeking for all those years. And it was, uh, it, it, you know, and I, I, I don't think deconstruction is a phase. <coughs> Excuse me. I think it's a, a way of life um, yeah. where, where we are always in a position of questioning everything that comes our way and seeking the truth and um, not blindly accepting everything that's fed to us. So um, yeah, even though I left the ministry in 2010, it wasn't like anything was over. I, I it was my, like I was set free into a, a, a larger pasture to figure things out. That's a, that's very similar to my path as well. I was I actually left in the middle of seminary because oh, yeah. I, I just couldn't, um, I just felt unsettled. Uh, and I wasn't even hundred sure why or what exactly. And I did end up still going into full-time ministry. Um, but with a lot of questions and, um, and still seeking, um, when I think it was, I did end up leaving the church. Um, I felt called to leave the church actually if that you know whatever that sounds and i sort of feel like a missionary to the church in some ways because i can see both sides and understand a little bit i'm not saying i know everything but absolutely don't know it that's one thing i know is i don't know anything okay. um but um i i think that there's been stages just like you said it doesn't just end um you know in 2009 was a biggie for me and then 2016 was a biggie for me and I'll have to say that some of those times whenever I would discover this whole other realm or this whole other science thing that came up or this other situation, um, it felt like a death almost. Mm. And, and I felt like duped a little bit, mm -hmm. if that's okay to say, and almost like depressed mm -hmm. um, about like kind of wasting time in that, you know, or, you know, belief system or whatever. But then, but then later, was able to look at it with gratitude and say like, you know what, that served a purpose in my time of what I needed. It may have saved me from like getting into drugs or alcohol or, you know, doing something crazy because I just had so much fear about like being a good girl or whatever. And right. you know, that there's different things that, that may have been what I picked or what I needed during that time um, for me to really get the big picture because now I feel like I have a bigger picture and I'm not saying I have the whole picture, but I, you know, hopefully can be more relatable to different people in different situations and, mm -hmm. and, and also build credibility because I 
I will own it if I'm wrong. I mean, I've had to burn teachings and CDs and say like, hey, remember this? This is crazy when I remember, when I really believe that. And I don't believe that anymore, but this is what I believe now. And probably in five minutes, I won't believe what I'm saying right now. You know, who knows? And I, I just kind of keep it really, really loose because I'll say yeah. what I believe now is, and that could be different tomorrow. So what do you say to any of that? Yeah, well, that's a big thing for me and for a lot of people. Um, I, I see a lot of people struggling with shame and embarrassment and humiliation for their past. They can't believe they believe that. They can't believe they did that. Now, look, I've been around the block when it comes to the church. Like I've been in very high octane, like Pentecostal meetings and vineyard and mm -hmm. healing vineyard. ministries. And, and yeah, I was a vineyard pastor for a while. I worked with John Paul Jackson for years. I don't know if you're familiar with John Paul. I traveled with him and Bob Jones. I've got a lot of stories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I, Bob I worked, was my mentor for worked, 15 years. I worked I, I, I worked for John Paul for a while. I planted a church for him in, uh, wow. New, Where? in New Hampshire. I, I probably knew you or met you. Probably I mean, did. I've been there. I was there many, many times. That's yep. amazing. Maybe that's how we're reconnecting again, because I mean, all I saw was naked pastor. I didn't even know your name. And then when I kept seeing your name, David Hayward, I was like, God, that sounds so familiar. But yeah, well, naked pastor came after New Hampshire when I went. So I went down and planted a church in New Hampshire for John Paul because he moved his ministry from Texas to yep. um, New London, New Hampshire. Yep. And um so he asked if I would come because we had him here at, for conferences for speaking and he liked my, the way I was a pastor. And so he wanted me to come and plant a church down there called it the bridge. Yes. And I think it's still going. Yeah. 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 That. yeah. yeah. So yeah, I keep Bob's picture right in front of me. Every, every meeting I, I do Bob Jones up here too. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea this was yeah, Bob Jones, Mike, Mike Bickle, um, you know, all the big names. We had them all yeah. up here. Uh, um, um, oh, who's the one? Uh, and your vineyard church was where was it? Rossay, um, New, New Brunswick. Okay. Near yeah, St. Paul, New Brunswick. Uh, I've been yeah. there. I've been to your church. Didn't what? Know it. What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. Interesting. Wow. Paul Keith, I mean, we, Paul Keith Davis as well. And, you know, Bobby Connor, all those guys yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. and their integrity. I mean, they got, you know, especially Bobby and Bob and Paul Keith and, and God bless John Paul. You know, I get emotional talk, thinking about them, you know, but uh, their, their integrity and their character and they're always so cutting edge and they still are so cutting mm -hmm. edge and really tapped into intuition and the prophetic and, you know, the truth, you know, and, and yeah, there's so much more. There's just more all the time more. Yeah. So my point is I, w I was in all that stuff. I was, you know, uh, to the to Toronto blessing and all that. So, so crazy. And I've also been in very mainline Presbyterian, you know, reform theology and everything. So I've been around the block. I've been, you know, I've experienced it all. And, and, I know a lot of people who struggle with that in their past. And I, and I tell them, look, you, you wouldn't be who you are now unless you were who you were then. Being who you were then actually makes up who you are now. If you, if you tried to go back and tear that chapter out of your life, you wouldn't make sense now. And, and so it's kind of like a compare it to uh, compost, which is half mm -hmm. earth and half shit. Right. <laughs> it's kind of like you can bleep that out if you want to but that's, it, that's, it's kind of, logo. <laughs> that's that's kind of like our lives where it's half good and half bad and it all gets folded in together and makes the soil out of which we grow and and we so we need to figure out kind of in a Jungian sense um how to integrate stuff we can't we can't reject it we can't dismiss it we can't sublimate it we can't you know ignore it we need to figure out how to integrate it and, and become individuated adults and, and um, appreciate, you know, how this is made. This has partly made us who we are now. Like I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. I wouldn't be able to be doing what I'm doing now. I wouldn't have the kind of flavor or 
my kind of wisdom or my kind of um, experience to help people and serve people if I didn't go through all that crazy stuff I went through. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's just helped me be who I am. And so, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, I, I'm not ashamed of that as a child, I believed in Santa Claus. Uh, it's just, you know, it, it was part of my childhood and, you know, I was, you could say I was duped. Um, but also, uh, it was fun. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it taught me a lot about generosity and celebration and sharing and laughter and mystery and fear and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it, we just, we just learn how to integrate it into our lives. The problem is though, that there's people out there and even in the de deconstruction world who hum humiliate people for believing what they believed. Mm. And <clears throat> like, I'm, I'm not interested in mocking people who do crazy worship stuff. I'm not interested because that's their business. Nobody's getting hurt. Right. So, and if, and because I did that myself in my past mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I didn't hurt anybody. And, and so it's just, you know, it, it's just humans being human in, in their own particular way. And, you know, I, be I believed in crazy stuff. The reason I got saved when I was a teenager was because I had this living hell scared out of me with end time teaching and last mm -hmm. day theology. Oh, I'm going to start on that one. <laughs> Armageddon and all that mm. stuff. <clears throat> Work of the beast. Like I was terrified. And that's mm. why I became a Christian. And, you know, people can say, you believe that stuff? What? You believe that stuff? And it's like, yeah, I believe that stuff. And mm. So I, I don't I don't I don't mock people or criticize people for believing that now or, you know, dancing in the spirit now or speaking in tongues or believing they have gold dust on their hands or what. I don't care about all that. I don't care. My What I care about is, are you free to be your authentic self wherever you are? And if you can find a safe place to do that. Yeah, that that that. Um... End times thing is a big one for me because I can remember, as a, as a particularly as a youth, you know, young to mid teenagers, it's like <clears throat> yeah. the church felt it was the their responsibility. Well, that was the age that most people fell away or backslid. In other words, they started finding their own feet and start questioning. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what they would do is, and I don't even blame them for it. Uh, you know, like you say, when you truly heal from this stuff, okay. you don't look back with with anger or pain anymore but i look back and i think what they would do is they would sit us down as, as teenagers and show us like you know films about the end times and this is what's going to happen you know and if you better get right with jesus because otherwise you're, you're going to be on the wrong side and, and try and scare us into following their path um and you know in a non-judgmental way i understand why they did that as, as horrible as it is and as how much damage it did to us you know, their heart was, we want you to be successful in life. And and I think when you can, in their interpretation, they weren't trying to be horrible to us. They weren't trying to be mean to us. They did what they thought was best. So I think when you heal, you can actually see that and, and appreciate it. Now, I wouldn't be happy if they did it to my kids. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, the, the whole end times thing, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that where we're headed as a, as a species, as a planet, is is very, very good, very, very benevolent. I think things are getting better. Yes, there's some negative things going on. Um, how would you, in, in the mindset you're in nowadays, how would you sort of interpret the sort of like social issues that are going on? And, and yeah. if you believe the news, you'd think the world was getting worse. But I don't believe it is. I think what's happening is the struggle of the constraints on humanity that we're actually breaking them off in the way that you're kind of describing. But would you agree with that? And how would you interpret kind of the things going on in the, in the world? Um, yeah, before I answer that, though, just about our kids. Uh, one, oh, thing on. Lisa, one thing Lisa and I said to our kids ever, ever since we can remember was, listen, one day you're going to need therapy for us being your parents. <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll help pay for it. Yeah. So it's kind of like an understanding that we we all do the best we can, and but we're gonna 
um, unintentionally harm you in some ways and that you'll need to figure stuff out and we want to help you do that. Um, but I agree with you hundred percent that my parents never meant to harm me. They did what they, you know, thought was best, even, even, uh, even corporal punishment, um, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, on the surface looks very cruel at their heart was they were concerned a lot of fear-based stuff where yeah. they needed to keep us in the straight and narrow and keep us away from harm, keep us away from the devil, keep us away from sin, keep us away yeah. from hell, you know, and, and, uh, it was a lot of fear-based, fear-driven stuff. And um, yeah, so that as to your question about the, the direction of the world, I believe now for a while that conservatism is a reaction to progress. Mm -hmm. So um, when... You know, when we see advances, what I consider advances in um, social development, such as LGBTQIA inclusion, um, trans rights, um, women's equality and rights, um, um, people of color, uh, you know, First Nations, you know, when, you know, when we're wrestling with this, these very serious issues and realities and, uh, and we're seeing, hopefully we're seeing progress in some of these areas. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I think that's like the gas pedal. And I think the cons ultra conservative or the right wing or the you know, alt-right or whatever, the conservative response is to put the brakes on, to keep slow things down. Um, some are even like trying to get it back into reverse uh, and go in the opposite direction. So that's that's my view of progress, mm -hmm. is that as 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 we do progress and, and we see um, more and more uh, visible public outrage for injustice, and attempts to um, make a more just world and, and compassionate world, you're going to see uh, even more backlash from um, the right conservatism. <clears throat> and so uh, that's that's what I think we're seeing happen. Is that's that's why I think we're seeing the rise of you know populist ideas and populist leader and uh, leaders and charismatic politicians and so on um, provoking uh, 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 the fear of, of people uh, in the world that their jobs are being taken or their land is being taken or their houses are being taken or their women are being taken or their, you know, whatever. And uh, so they, they apply the break. So um I agree with you. And I, I think there's a, a sociologist, is it Stephen Pink? He talks a lot about how he believes things are actually improving. Mm. Even though I think the, it is, yes, it is Stephen Pink. Yeah. 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 Uh, even though the news portrays, uh, you know, tragedy just because it sells. And, uh, but yeah, so I, I kind of agree with you on that point, although it's very, very frustrating. It's like Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of justice is very long, but oh my God, does it ever feel long? Mm -hmm. and, um, and very frustrating. Right. Yeah, I, I I see exactly what you're saying, and I also see like entertainment or entrainment, whether it's Hollywood news, you know, any kind of social media, whatever. That it's almost I feel, in my opinion, is it's they want the division that the someone's even up above all of that orchestrating like us to be pit against one another, whether it's religion, color, you know, gender, you know, all of that. And, and even cause confusion amongst everybody to just, you know, which, so I'm not a fan of, of confusion or division. Um, right. you know, I'm, I am very <clears throat> loving and I, I love people yeah. wherever they're yeah. at. Yeah. And, um, but I don't like that whole feeling that someone else is up there trying to put people against each other in the first place. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't really mind blowing, but you know, a, a couple of years ago when the whistleblower from Facebook 
um, when she exposed that um, Facebook and the metaverse and so on uh, allows conflict because it just creates more traffic. Right. And, and same with YouTube, where um, once you, if you watch one video that, where there's a little bit of uh, conflict or violence or whatever, or conspiracy stuff, uh, it's it sort of um, sucks you into this hole where you just go deeper and deeper and deeper down this hole, and and that's the whole point is they want you to get on their site and stand there saying they don't care what the content is, whatever it is that keeps you there, and they found that this kind of strange uh, conspiracy theory, violent, racist, white supremacist, all this stuff is what keeps people. It's 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 rage that keeps people um, on their platforms, and and she and and she blew the whistle saying Facebook knows this, and you know that's why they're very slow to respond to uh, misogynist posts or racist posts or white supremacist posts. It's because it it just engages enraged, um, you know, people and and keeps them on. Um, <clears throat> platform and, and just keeps the engine running and and it makes the uh, you know stockholders very happy <laughs> yeah no that's well, right sorry go ahead Sean. no i was gonna say and yeah censorship like crazy like even my channel was taken and who knows if this would be taken just by saying some of the words you just said i mean they're very like on top of all of those things but what were you gonna say craig i'm sorry I was just going to sort of like broadly overview the, what's being said is that it brings me back to what I believe, what I call the Christ message, because I figured out that um, a lot of people get triggered by the word gospel because it's, mm. it's of the connotations. I So I, I to, when I'm talking to some individuals, I mean, I'll say that to, if I'm talking to Christians, no problem. Um, but um, I, I call the Christ message is that is this the Christ that lives in all? You know, we are all pure and divine by nature you know the religion teaches that we're all sinful by nature um that that's not the good news that's not good news at all the good right. news is that christ identified with us to show us who we are and what we are that's my belief that's that's, that's my interpretation of, of what jesus was about right regardless of of any external expression I think what my, my opinion is is that we we as a species need to remember our divinity, um, and when we do, we will be unified. We will come together. All these things that d separate and divide will just be abolished. And I think, like Shana was alluding to, um, there are I do believe that there are social engineers who don't want this to happen because, like you say, it it's a part of the control system. But I think it's game over for them because we are waking up to this reality. Uh -huh. um, that we truly are one. We are one species. We're all, you know, cosmically connected. We're consciously connected. We are all expressions of the one divine consciousness. Uh -huh. I don't want to sound new agey or anything like that. I'm just trying to express in a way that's um, palatable that, uh -huh. you know, that, that what Jesus taught us and, and when we actually get his message, all this division will be over regardless of what they do because we the people will be awake to this. I don't, I don't know if you agree with that. Well, it, you know, have you got anything on that at all? Yeah, the um, um, I know here in the U.S. Or not here in the U.S. I'm in I'm in Canada, so <laughs> I gotta remember that. In the U.K., oh, the same thing. Don't worry about it. No, I know uh, being in Canada, <laughs> but um, you know, people like Richard Rohr, who uh, they're they're writing books about the sort of the cosmic Christ and the universe. Mm -hmm. Jesus and and so on, um, Eckhart Tolle and and others right. are are all touching on that theme. And it's it's interesting to me that you know each religion has its own um, distinct distinctives, and each denomination has its own distinctives. But when you get closer and closer and closer to um, uh, a, a sort of a mystical understanding of a, re, a religion, you, you start sounding like 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 when you're reading philosophers or mystics, Christian mystics, mystics mm -hmm. of other religions. Yeah, 
yeah. um, or uh, you know, quantum physicists and so on. It's it's like they all start sounding the same. Right. And so that's that's my my theory is that there is a language out there. There is a language available to us if we if we are compassionate enough and careful enough to choose our words that comes from a universal understanding and a universal articulation of of what is true. And so like like when you read people like Meister Eckhart, a Christian um Mystery. Or if you read David Bohm or Carlo Rovelli or the quantum physicists, or if you're reading um, like like Richard Rohr or, you know, uh, philosophers like Slavoj Žižek, even though he claims to be uh, he's a living philosopher now, even though he claims to be a, a, an atheist, he calls himself a Christian atheist. And, <laughs> and, and when, when they all start sounding like they're trying to describe the same thing. Right. Yeah. And, and that that's to me where where it's at is trying to figure out the that kind of a compassionate universal language that describes the universal reality that we, we've been talking about right yeah i can see that completely yeah yeah that's awesome. and, and I, I, I i agree and i think you know i think we need to transcend the current political system you know my opinion is that you know w you know in even my youth, you know, things were fairly divided. Over here, we have, you know, conservative and labor, um, traditional socialist versus capitalist type thing. And I think it's just a, it's just a failed system. I think the system no longer serves us. Um, and, and I think there needs to be an introduction of something. I, I can't say I know what, but something that is less divisive, that it's not red versus blue, left versus right sort of thing, that there must be some way that 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 contains and, and, and accepts the fact that we're all one and um, we're all one. We, when you talk to people i mean you know you can have a political opinion if you actually talk to someone who has an opposing opinion you'll find you have a lot of similarities the problem is the media the news um all the the, the devices that they use to try and divide us um it, it is just outrageous when you actually look at it but when you, if you actually come together and talk to them you realize we're, we all want the same thing. You know right. I mean? That's and the I, word I was looking for, outrage. That, that's, uh, what, that's what fuels um, online. The machine. Ma yeah. The machine is outrage, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. It. Just, Sorry, go on, Shana. I just had dinner with um, uh, Maria. She's been on our show, and she was coming through, and she was talking about, we were talking about a, a family member who, um, was serving in the military and was overseas and um, having some PTSD issues because this young man actually had to shoot for a, another person. And the kid it ended up being, it, when he got closer and saw, it was like a kid, probably around 14 years old. And it was also, I mean, the kid who shot the kid was like barely 18. And um, he, you know, you're not... He was he was saying that he wouldn't. Um, uh, I'm getting this from the mother, but um, was saying that he went over there and stayed and held his hand and was with him all the way till the the guy passed, the kid passed, and he said he realized in that moment that he was just fighting for what he believed those thoughts, and that the kid who shot him was only believing what he was believing, and how yet how human when you're looking at someone's face and you're watching them literally struggling to, to stay alive on the planet, you know, how human everyone really is when we, when we, when we have that opportunity to get together. But I think a lot of these screens and, you know, um, television and like trolls and people who can just like super easily, you know, either hit a button and bomb someone or shoot wherever from whatever, or, you know, whether it's social media where they're like, oh, I'm just going to troll and say how much I hate you. And, you know, I'm not going to say anything about some of the stuff that people have said and tell and instructional to go do this or go do that. I mean, and not nice things. Um, yeah. You know, from a uh, quarterback armchair type situation where they don't know anything that's really going on, but they're just like angry and posting and trolling and, you know, it's like they would never say that probably to, you know, someone at the supermarket when they're walking by and 
Maybe well, they got on a t-shirt that represents something they don't like. They're who I don't think a lot of people, in my opinion, would, would just walk up to someone and go, that t-shirt represents blah, blah, blah. And you are wrong. And la, la, la. I mean, people don't do that in real life that I've seen, right. um, you know, but it seems a lot easier and, and more cowardly to kind of have those conversations and, or like almost like a, a hit and run, you know, where it's like, let me just do this. And then they're off to the next thing, but that's causing a whole thread of, you know, people responding. And it's like, you know, you just threw a bomb and ran away, you know? Yeah. But, um, so I don't think this, uh, as much as this can be used for super good, you know, here he's in UK, you're in Canada, I'm in the States and we're having this amazing conversation and it could also be used for harm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, uh, I get I get hateful stuff all the time and very nasty comments and it's a full time job to uh, moderate you know my Instagram account and my Facebook and Twitter and TikTok, um, uh, but I I delete all hateful comments and if people persist I block them, I I just have no problem doing that because I want I want I want to create. Um, as safe a space as possible for people to experience what community can be like. Right. And bullies always win if they're not stopped. So um, hmm. I, I, I just don't allow them to, it's, it's like Sasha Baron Cohen, the comedian um, actor guy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Borat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, he, he said freedom of speech doesn't mean you have freedom of reach. And so mm -hmm. I, I apply that. Yes, you're allowed freedom of speech, but you're not allowed to say hateful things in this room. It's like if somebody came into my house and started saying hateful things and nasty things, some of the things that are said to me online, I wouldn't let them stay in my house and I wouldn't invite them back. And, uh, you know, not only for my sake, but for the sake of the other people who are gathered here. And and so I think if, if more of us would... Um, would do that and, and not be afraid of being seen as undemocratic or being like a dictator or a whatever by controlling what's said in the community. Uh, I think, you know, creating more and more healthy spaces, safe spaces for people is one way to overcome that hate. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Hopefully it'll grow. <clears throat> So, well, so I, I was just going to say one more uh, thing, Shadow. Was was I'd, I'd love to know. Let's change the subject slightly. Do you have a spiritual practice nowadays? Do you have a sort of um, prayer time, anything like that? I'd, I'd, I'm just interested to know if you're willing to share. So I, like I said, I grew up in the church. I was in the ministry for 30 years. I've had you know spiritual directors, monks, gurus. You know, I've I've done it all. And when when I left the ministry in 2010, I knew that my big um, project was going to have to be to get out of my head. Like mm -hmm. I was so in my head, like that, and that experience I had in 2009 made me realize, you know, and then the, the, all the theological anxiety that I'd been experienced for so many years that was finally put to rest. And I felt this peace of mind. I knew I knew I had to learn just how to be in my body and be, get out of my head and just enjoy my life. So now um, my, my daily practice is, is to get up and read some really contemplative material um, and then, you know, a book and then write in my journal. I write down any dreams I might've had that night. Then I, I do my breathing. I, I have some breathing um, yeah. exercises that I do. <clears throat> And then I um, have cold shower, you know, the whole Wim Hof thing. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then I, uh, I do my work, my working out, I do exercise, I run and I do weights and, and everything. Um, and then I, I go out for walks in nature. And so it's all very out of my head, you know, and in my body and just appreciating life. Um, I, I knew also I had to learn about business and money because I had really, really unhealthy attitudes about money and business, <laughs> that it was all sinful and right. filthy oh, and God. compromised, compromised. Oh, everything. yeah, the poverty mindset. Right? Yeah. Poverty, I'm totally a poverty mentality. And I yeah. knew I had to overcome that. Mm -hmm. And so that's been my my uh, spiritual practice 
ever since 2010. And, you know, I'm a lot healthier now than I was 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, do tell us where can people find you? I mean, I know where to find you. And we're going to have all the links up here for you guys who just want something clickable. Um, but just verbally for those who are listening or maybe hearing this on an audio driving down the road, um, tell us where people can find you. Well, um, nakedpastor.com is home base. That's my main site and everything. Um, you can find me uh, there. I'm naked pastor right across the interwebs. I'm, I'm on, you know, Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, TikTok. I'm all over the place. Um, and if you Google naked pastor, make sure it's one word, because if you Google naked pastor, oh, no. <laughs> don't be doing you that. Find naked pastors <laughs> they, they do exist. And, and so, but I, I'm the naked pastor, one word. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, uh, you can find me all over the place. So, and I'm really good at responding. If you reach out by email or a direct message or anything like that, I'm really good at responding. So, cause I love connecting with people. Really? Yeah. I'm the same. Yeah. I like it. Good. Cool. Awesome. Well, you guys can find me to swiftfire.org or drsornell.com. Um, very, very thankful for this conversation and for your time with us today. And um, yeah, just, I had no idea. I knew I was following a lead. I just had it in my heart to, to connect, but I didn't realize how many more of these like connections connections we had yeah. and and all of this and uh, really so that's really fun and uh we might have some more to talk about but yeah yeah <laughs> yeah craig tell that's us cool. where people can find you um i'm on facebook as well um i've, I've got my meditation music channel i'm a musician uh david oh, as cool. well um i do i'm in a band called nth ascension um yeah, I think all, all my links are in the bio, so so go there. I just want to make one more point. You know, this has been coming a lot recent, up a lot recently. Is you both knew Bob Jones, <clears throat> and he had his experience in the seventies where he died and he went to heaven, um, and he uh, he tells the story that you know, and I find it interesting. And we've talked about this, Chanel. That Jesus wasn't say uh, Jesus was greeting people, and he wasn't saying, "Did you read my Bible?" He didn't say, "Did you live." holy or anything like that he was asking did you learn to love that's the number one priority on, on the heart of god the heart of christ and and i think that's something that we really need to remember i just want to finish with that because i think that's important i agree mm. amen and women <laughs> yeah <and> women <laughs> equality awesome, awesome. Well, well you guys have a delightful day oh were you say something dave no i just said cool yeah cool. we, well awesome. thanks for watching thanks for being with us and thank you david yeah yeah i feel like this hour kind of like psh, zoomed by so fast I zoom by. <laughs> you guys thanks definitely you know. check out all the stuff and i mean i love the art i think i that's i think it's cartoons are powerful yeah, and the days of memes as well i mean memes are so powerful aren't they it's, it's really getting yeah. in there with that yeah it's brilliant <laughs> it I says, have yeah it crosses all in in you know um religions and you know yep. interpretations and what have you and it's just fun like you said so i appreciate that and mm -hmm. um those of you guys who are members thank you for your membership thank you for keeping us going uh, we do have a meeting coming up and i'll have more details on that too we have our monthly meeting and um i hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your afternoon and we appreciate you guys tuning in and please do share like you know get out um, help us break out of whatever algorithms um, this and that happens. But um, thank you again for being with us today and we will talk soon. All right. Bye-bye guys. Bye. Bye.